Well, I still remember the day I met Jesus. It was a, a warm day. The sun was high up in the sky. I guess that was pretty much every day in the desert. You see, I grew up in Jericho. It's about 17 miles east of the big city, Jerusalem. But Jericho itself had, had quite a life of its own. A lot of hustle and bustle, and people always coming and going from Jerusalem. And, and so sometimes there were those people who would come through the city like a whirlwind and stir it all up. And Jesus was one of those. Even before he got to the city gate, I remember there was such a stir about him because he had healed a man named Bartimaeus. We all knew him. I mean, he'd been out there outside the city gate for a long time, blind man. Now he could see because of his encounter with Jesus. And so everybody's coming around him trying to meet this Jesus, jostling for position to, to get to know him. Now, I was only 12, maybe 13 at the time, but, but I weaseled my way in through the crowd to get close because everybody was saying this man worked miracles, that this was the Messiah who was coming to Jerusalem to launch his kingdom. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a part of this? And so I got close, and, and there was this anticipation rising. I mean, I didn't fully get it at the time, but I heard my mom and dad talk. I heard the anticipation and the, the hope that everybody had, and it, it kind of caught me up in it too. But Jesus didn't seem to be caught up in it. He didn't seem like he was in a rush anywhere. Even as he walked down that main drag the first day in Jericho, he didn't seem like he was in a rush. In fact, he saw this, this little man named Zacchaeus. He was a, a wee little man. We had songs we would sing about him as kids, making fun of him. And, and Zacchaeus, Jesus sees him up in the tree, and he calls him down and invited himself over for dinner. And then, of course, I wasn't invited in. I, I stuck outside, but, but I stayed close by so that when Jesus came back out, I could get close again. And as I got close, I heard Jesus say something about how salvation had come today. Today. And he called himself the Son of Man. I mean, my friends, this was Messiah talk. And so that revolution that we'd all longed for and hoped for, it was here now. The kingdom of God was being rolled out right in front of us. He was going to go to Jerusalem, vanquish all the enemies. It was happening right before our eyes. At least, that's what we thought. See, I remember the day so clearly, but there were elements that I didn't fully understand at that age. See, Jesus, at this point, he, he caught on to all our expectation, and he decided to tell a story. He tells a, a parable of how he saw his kingdom rolling out. And at that point, you know, it seemed to change everything that we expected. And Jesus tells this story, and, and I remember it so clearly, but I never fully understand it until I, many years later, picked up a biography about Jesus. One of his later disciples, a man named Luke, he wrote a book about Jesus where he captured so many scenes from his life. And in Luke, he narrated this picture. If you have that book in front of you, open it up with me. In the Gospel of Luke, he tells us about the story that Jesus tells. And everything, as I read this story back and remembered that day, it became crystal clear for me. Here's what Jesus said. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return home. And so he called ten of his servants and he gave them ten minas. Now, a mina is not a coin. It's, in fact, a, about a hundred coins. It's a lot of money, about three months' wages. And these coins that he left, it's, it's a lot of money. He gave it to them, and he said, now put it to work until I come back. But his subjects hated him, and they sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. And he was made king nonetheless, and then he returned home. See, this, this was a common story in my day. There were all kinds of absentee landlords, and there were, there were nobles with way too much money, so they would leave some behind when they go off to do business, or in this case, to get authority from a greater empire. And they would leave it behind, hoping that their servants would put it to work and earn more, so that when they came back, they would have more in the estate. And we were all following along with Jesus' hypothetical story until he threw that curveball. Did you catch it? He, he said that there was a delegation that didn't like him, and, and they sent them up there to oppose him as king. And at that point, we all realized what Jesus was alluding to. You see, we were on the Upper East Side of Jericho in front of Zacchaeus' house. This is where all the rich people lived. And over the hill, just on a little rise past some houses, was a palace. 
that was built by Archelaus. Archelaus was one of the Herods, the family that kind of ran Israel in that day under the Roman Empire. Now, Herod Archelaus was the son of Herod the Great, who, if you ask me, wasn't that great. He was crazy. Did, built some good things, built some really cool things, but the dude was crazy, okay? And, and so Herod the Great, sorry, I'm getting off track. He, once upon a time, went all the way to Rome to get the title King of the Jews. And then he came home, he ruled for about 40 years. And when he died, his son Archelaus, one of many sons, traveled to Rome just like he did to be called king over all of us. And in that time, there was one difference between the two. And that is that everybody hated Archelaus. Everybody hated him. Here's why. His first Passover, when he took power after his dad's death, he went into the temple courts and he slaughtered 3,000 Jews, mostly priests, on Passover. That does not go well to gain popularity. But see, Archelaus didn't care about popularity. He just wanted to instill fear. I, I've heard about one of the great leaders in your day, a guy named Michael Scott, who was once asked if he would rather be feared or loved. And, and oh, you've heard of him. Good. And, and he, he was asked if you'd rather be feared or loved. And he said, easy, both. I'd, ra I'd rather they be afraid of how much they love me. That was not Archelaus. See, Archelaus just wanted to be feared, and he did a good job of instilling that. And so there was a delegation of about 50 religious people who moseyed up after him to Rome, and they, they went against him before Caesar, and Caesar listened. And he sent Archelaus back with the king of a, as the king of a smaller kingdom without the title. His fiefdom lasted maybe 10 years before he was no more banished forever. But years down the line, here we are in front of Zacchaeus' house, and we could still see the palace that he'd built here in Jericho. And in that moment, we knew what Jesus was referring to in this story. A king that traveled far away and then eventually came back to rule. A king who was opposed as he went. And sure enough, it, we got it. This was the first king that Jesus was referring to in his story. But, but there was more to it. It was like he was taking the story of Herod Archelaus and somehow matching it with his own story, a king who would go away to a far land and then be opposed and rejected and end up coming back to rule as the inevitable king. And Jesus, you see, had a second king in mind. Right under the surface of the, the story was Jesus himself. He was weaving his expectations in to this familiar story. Now, I got to be honest with you. At that time, I, I didn't really get it. But when I went and I read back over the story, it all started to make sense to me. Because when Jesus told it that day, I missed the point. But here's what he was trying to do. I think he was trying to turn our expectations, to turn our expectations in such a way that everybody wanted him to ride into Jerusalem, to unroll his kingdom right then, right there, vanquish all his enemies, free God's people. That was the freedom they wanted to see. But Jesus is telling them, no, no, no. I'm going to have to go away for a while. I'm going to go away. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be crucified. Then eventually I'll come back. And we didn't get it. See, on that day, everybody's celebrating Jesus. They all wanted him to be their king. But Jesus knew that there was rejection and opposition coming, not more than a couple days from then. And after all this, only after all this, would he come back as king. And, and so here's the question, right? If Jesus tied himself into this story, and he said, I'm going to go away for a while, then what are his followers supposed to do while he's gone? And that's exactly where he took the story next. Keep reading with me. Luke writes of Jesus telling the story. He says that this king, once he returned home, he sent for the servants to whom he'd given the money in order to find out what they'd gained with it. And the first one came and he said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. That's, that's pretty good, right? He said, Well done, good servant. You've been trustworthy and faithful in this small matter. Now take charge of ten cities. The second one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. And the master said, Sweet, you take charge of five cities. And then another servant came and he said, Sir, sir, here, here's your mina. 
I, I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take out what you didn't put in and you reap what you didn't sow. And his master replied, You'll ju- I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man? taking out what I didn't put in, reaping what I didn't sow. Well, then why didn't you give it to the bank to put it on deposit so I could at least have a little bit of interest with it? And then he said to those standing by, take the one mina he has away from him, give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, I mean, he already has ten. He he doesn't need more. And he said, I tell you the truth. Those who have, more will be given to them. But as for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And you should have seen us all sitting there, leaning in, listening intently as Jesus talked. When he painted this picture of these first two servants, it was, it was like something to aspire to, you know? It was like these, these men were, were faithful to their master, and, and I want to be faithful too. So we aspired to that. It was this beautiful picture But the part that blew me away was not just how much increase they had. I mean, 10 times, 5 times, that's a pretty good return on investment. I wish my portfolio looked like that. But but more than that, what blew me away is the praise he gives and lets them keep all the interest they earned. It was the master's money, but he lets them keep it. And not only that, but he lavishes more on them, more opportunity, more responsibility, gives them 10 cities, five cities to rule. I mean, if you ask me, that seems like a bit of a jump. Hey, good job with your allowance. Now you're a mayor. I don't know. But that's, I think, a picture of the graciousness and the generosity of the master. See, these first two servants, they reveal this picture of of a master who's generous, who's gracious. How can we miss that? But then, then comes the third servant. And when Jesus told us about the third servant, man, it was like the air was sucked out of the room, you know? I mean, there were quizzical looks on some faces, angry looks on others, because none of us would ever squander an opportunity like this. And yet this man just wasted it. See, no one in their right mind with even a shred of love for their master would think of hiding three months' wages under their mattress. But this is exactly what he did. It's the most ridiculous, most careless, faithless thing he could have done. He could have at least taken it to the bank, deposited it, and gotten at least a little bit of return on investment. The economy was good. Because remember, the master gave him a command. He gave him a charge. And that was to put the money to work. Put it to work. Invest it somewhere. Do something with it. Risk if you have to. Because without risk, there's no reward. But do something with it. And instead, he rejected this command and he just hid it away. See, the master is inviting these servants to make something of this opportunity, to get in on the growth of the estate. And it was a tremendous opportunity for him, not only to show that he trusted the master, but to show himself trustworthy, and yet he missed it. To simply wrap it up in a hanky and hide it under his mattress? I mean, you got to be kidding me. By doing this, what the master does, or the servant does, as the servant reveals what he thinks of his master. I mean, he says it out loud. He says, I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. But more than that, he, he kind of shows his cards that he has no trust, no love in his master. None. See, if you ask me, this third servant totally misread his master's heart. He totally misread his master's heart. The servant calls him a harsh man, almost accusing him of being a thief, Stealing, taking what isn't his, what he didn't put in, making everybody else do all the hard work for him and just reaping all the benefits, keeping it for himself. But if you look at the master, that's not him at all, is it? The master gives graciously, generously. Here, keep all the interest yourself. Here, rule cities where you can make even more. I mean, this is not somebody that's keeping it close. This is somebody that's giving generously and graciously. It kind of makes me wonder if sometimes I miss God's heart, you know? Like if I mistake, make wrong assumptions about God, maybe it's a question you need to think about, you know? Is it possible that maybe your assumptions of God are off a little bit? Let, Let me just ask you, what are your working assumptions about God? Is God a, an angry, 
man upstairs that, that rules with a, a big old white beard and just waiting to throw down fire on you when you mess up? Is he, is he an exacting deity up there shaking his head in shame and disgust at all that you've done? Or is God gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, rich in mercy, good to all? Sorry, I don't want to get preachy on you. It's just the question that kind of comes to mind as I read his parable again. Because I think it's possible for us to totally misread our master's heart. And what you believe about God determines how you're going to respond to him, doesn't it? What you believe about God determines how you're going to respond to him. We see that in this third servant here. And so this third unfaithful servant, he assumed things about his master that were totally off base. And his response shows it. But even so, the master responds to him, takes his assumptions, and says, you know what, I'll work on your, on your playing field, okay? If you assume those things about me, let's work within that. He says, so you assumed that I would want to return on my investment, did you? You assumed I would want more than I left with you. Then why didn't you act like that's true? Why didn't you invest it so I'd have something for me when I came back more than what I left you with? He plays his game. He judges him by his standards. You see, it might seem harsh that at this point the master takes that one mina away from him and gives it to the one who has ten, but but this man has already shown that he won't be faithful with whatever he's given. And, and you know, he condemns himself by his actions. He's already demonstrated that that principal investment won't go well here, so the master takes it and gives it to the one who has 10, and that's exactly the point. Everybody's up in arms. No, but he already has plenty. That's the point. He has plenty because he's invested what he was given well. So the master sees more return on investment and gives him the one mina. See, if you invest what you have well, you'll get more. If you invest what you have well, you'll get more. If you squander it, if you do nothing, if you hide it away, keep it for yourself, even what you have will be taken from you. And when it comes to what God gives us, our time, our talent, our treasure, well, it's a use it or lose it situation, isn't it? You know, over the years, I've thought back on that day so many times, all the the ways that this has changed me and challenged me, and I, I could never sum up the impact, that one story, one day that I had with Jesus and how it's changed me. But I hope that by retelling it a little bit to you, it has something of the same effect. Okay, so this is Jesus' parable, right? Okay, back to reality. It's Phil 2020. We're in Elk Grove now, okay? And some of you are like, dude, that pastor is schizophrenic. Maybe, maybe. (laughs) But, but back to reality, okay? Now, now, as I was reading this story this week, that what I couldn't get out of my mind, I just, I got wrapped into it. And, and I would challenge you and encourage you, as you read scripture, read it like it's real, because it is. It really happened. There were people there watching it unfold. Maybe you can be one of them to watch it unfold. And, and I hope that maybe through that first person lens, you were able to see things new like I was this week. But okay, back to Elk Grove 2020. What does this all mean to us? How do we apply it in our lives? I want to give you two applications as we kind of pull it together here this morning. Just two. And the first one is this, to accept Jesus as king. We got to accept Jesus as our king. And it might sound simplistic, but if you think about it, when Jesus came the first time, he came as savior. And when he comes back, he's going to come as a king. See, the first time he came and he said, he came to seek and save the lost. In fact, that's the verse that sets up this scene. That's the verse right before it. He says, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That was his mission. His whole reason for showing up was to open the door of salvation to people. But when he comes back, he's going to come back as king and judge to rule. And as he comes back, you see Jesus, he's up in heaven and he ascended back to heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father. And the Father Gave him the stamp of approval, well done, my son, you did what I asked you to do in opening the door of salvation. And scripture says that that God gave Jesus the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, every will will bend to him someday as the inevitable king. That's coming, he's coming back. 
But why the delay? Have you ever wondered that? Like, why take so long before coming back? I've wondered that question. Like, 2,000 years is a long time, God. You know, what's, what's going on, you know? It seems like it's taken forever. Why the delay? Here's what I'm learning, is that Jesus' delay leaves the kingdom door open longer so that many more may be saved. It leaves the kingdom door open longer so many more can squeeze in. Listen to what one of Jesus' best friends, a guy named Peter, once said. He said, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. And so with that math, he's only been gone two days. I mean, it's, it's just been the weekend, you know? Get ready for Monday. And he's, he continues, though. He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Sometimes it feels that way. It's been so long, God. What's taking you so long? He's not slow, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You know, as, as a dad, sometimes my kids feel like I'm really slow. And some of you parents are like, I know the feeling. Some of you kids are like, yeah, I know the feeling, right? But as a dad, sometimes my kids feel like I'm slow in giving them what they're asking, but I'm not slow so much as I'm patient. And I want to see if their attitude is going to change so I can give them that good thing that they're asking for. Is it possible that our God's heart is something of the same? That he is patient, wanting all to be saved. He's not slow, he's patient. Wanting all of us to be saved. That's our God's heart. By waiting, he's leaving the kingdom door open longer because the reality is, just like the opposition in the story, many of us still today are rejecting and opposing Jesus. Maybe you this morning are rejecting and opposing Jesus. Somebody drug you along with them and you're still awake, wonder of all wonders. But... But you're here, and you're still rejecting Jesus, maybe. See, there's this sobering statement at the end of the parable about how the king responded to those that opposed him. In short, the king brings before him all those who opposed him before the Caesar, and he slaughters them. And that's exactly what Herod Archelaus did. Brought all his opposition before him, slaughtered him. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, so if Jesus is the other king, what does that say about Jesus? Jesus will return as king. It's inevitable. He will be back. He will rule. He will reign. He will judge. And in his judgment, he won't be heartless. He won't be bloodthirsty like Archelaus, but he will carry judgment for those who rebel and reject and oppose him. And his judgment will be severe. It will be final. And this, I think, is one of those places where we can go wrong, and we can hear that about God and say, well, why would I want to worship a God like that? And we have these wrong assumptions about him, but God is not a God of condemnation. He is a God of love. Condemnation is an option we can choose. Do you understand that? You see, there's this familiar verse in Scripture. You, you might have it memorized. It's John 3, 16. And it's the most famous verse in all of Scripture. Sometimes you see it on big poster boards, somebody holding it up behind the goalpost at a football game, right? Right? You'll probably see it when the Niners beat the Chiefs today, right? Okay? <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Amen, church. And so, John 3, 16, you're going to see that poster board up there, and you're going to say it. Say it with me if you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, that's good news, isn't it? Oh, that's good. That our God saw our need, sent his Son to, to provide a way for us to be reconciled to him because of his love. That is so good. But sometimes we stop there. And we don't carry it on to keep on reading. See, after John 3, 16 comes another verse. It's verse 17. Isn't that cool? <laughs> okay, I got more for you. Um, and he says this. He says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why he came. He didn't come to condemn. He came instead to save the world through him. Because whoever believes in him is not condemned. Good news again. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the, in the name of the God's only Son, the one way of salvation that he gave us. Did you catch that? We have the opportunity, every opportunity, to embrace God's grace, accept him as Lord, as Savior, as King. But if we reject him, we condemn ourselves because we 
are rejecting Jesus, denying his rule and his reign. It's not that God is mean, it's that God is respectful. He honors us enough that if we rebel and stiff arm him and oppose him our whole life, that in eternity he'll say, okay, have it your way. C.S. Lewis, he would, he would one time say that there are in the end only two people in the world, two types of people. Those who go to God and say, your will be done. Who bend the knee and say, your will be done, God. And those to whom God will say, your will be done. We either bend the knee and, God, and say, your will be done, God. Or God looks at us and says, I wanted so much more for you. I wanted life and salvation. I wanted to give you my grace. But have it your way. See, the first challenge here is that we accept Jesus as king because he will come back. And this might strike fear in us, but it doesn't have to because when he comes back, if we are honestly pursuing God, if we are giving our time, our treasure, our talent to his kingdom work, then this will be a day of rejoicing and, and, and affirmation. This is going to be a beautiful day. But if we reject him, then we're heaping punishment upon ourselves. And so my challenge to you this morning is if you never have, accept Jesus as your Lord, your Savior, your King today. All he wants to do is make your life better. You know that? That's it. To give you life to the fullest now, life forever beyond this life, that's his promise to you. Why oppose him? Why reject him? Accept him as your King, your Savior today because he will someday be coming back he came once, he's coming again, but for now we live in the in-between. We live in the meanwhile, and here's application number two, is that we need to make the most of the meanwhile. We live in this meanwhile, and we need to make the most of the meanwhile. When he comes back, he's going to ask us some questions. He's going to ask, what did you do with all that I gave you? How did you invest the time I gave you, your talents, your treasure? How did you invest it in my kingdom purposes? Did you hide it away or did you put it to work in the meanwhile? Many of you, uh, many of you know my mother-in-law passed away about a year ago. And I'm the administrator of her estate. It's been a lot to juggle. We're walking through a joyful process called probate. It's good times had by all. <laughs> and uh, so I manage her assets, right? And uh, none of it is mine. Not a cent. Nothing is mine. But I'm in charge of managing it. And so what I did is I went and I put it under my mattress where it's safe. No, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. That would be stupid, right? No, so I put it in a bank where it can earn interest. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to manage that well. But about a week ago, the court came and asked, okay, we want you to document and account for everything that's happened over the last year. Every cent that's been spent, every utility bill paid, everything that has been happening in this estate, I have to account for every single bit of it. And it crossed my mind that that's exactly like this story where the master comes back and asks for an accounting of what's happened while it was gone. And the very same thing, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to ask for an accounting of how we invested our time, our talent, our treasure in his kingdom purposes. It's not something to hide away, but to put to work for his kingdom purposes. And so every single one of us, we have time, we have talent, we have treasure. And we get to invest those to make the most of the meanwhile, invest him in his kingdom purposes. And you might be here and you might say, no, Phil, I don't really have any time. Like, I'm really busy. Believe me, I get that, okay? I get busy. I don't really have a lot of talents, Phil. No, you have something. You do. I guarantee you got talents. Maybe you haven't even discovered them yet. You got gifts, spiritual gifts. I, I never wanted to teach. I didn't want to be in front of people. And then God's like, here, I, I gave you this gift. I'd like you to use it. And, and what I see is as you use your gifts, you start developing them, and you see God use them in ways you never thought he would. You might be here and you're thinking to yourself, well, I, maybe I have time and talent, but I definitely don't have any treasure. I got debt. I don't have any treasure. No, no, no. No, you do. See, God has given every single one of us time, talent, and treasure. It's up to us how we deploy it, how we spend it. Do we spend it on ourselves? Do we hide it away, or do we invest it in his kingdom purposes? And some have more, some have different ones, but we all have time, talent, and treasure. And ask, God is asking you simply to invest what he's given you to help others know and grow in him. It's that simple. And when, when you give all you are back to God, what you find is he gives so much more back to you. When you invest your gifts, you see them developed with kingdom 
that purposes that you never imagined when you give yourself back to God, you know, the, the more you give to the Lord, the more you see these incredible spiritual dividends. I'm thinking of Stella and Peggy and Frank and, and Rodney and, and John and so many who invested in me when I was a wee little lad, not like Zacchaeus wee, but, but like weer, and, and like a little baby and boy all the way growing up through my teenage years and teaching me scripture. And, and I don't want to sound arrogant, but I think their investment in me is paying some dividends. And maybe God's calling you to invest in some kids through Creekside here or, or our teens and in our youth ministry, maybe God's calling you to give your time, your talent that way. I thought of Mel and Al who came here to Creekside and had a pretty broken past. But as they walked on campus, invited by a neighbor or by a friend, they encountered somebody with a smile and a handshake, and they felt wrapped into God's family and welcomed in. Somebody put a face on grace for them. And I wonder if just maybe you could be that person who could welcome somebody in and put a face on grace for them as they walk on campus. Maybe you were welcomed well here, and you could say, you know, I want to be that for somebody else too. You could sign up for one of our guest service teams and, and say, you know, I don't know exactly what this looks like, but, but I want to give some of myself back to, to help others know Jesus. Oh man, we've got plenty of opportunity for you to do that. I'm thinking of some in our church who are blessed financially but realize they've been blessed to be a blessing, to give it away. Or others who don't have a lot but they still are giving sacrificially because they know that any investment in God's kingdom will pay more dividends than keeping it for themselves. How are you investing your time, your talent, your treasure to help others know and grow in Jesus? And if you don't know how to answer that question, then I would invite you, come find me in the atrium afterwards. Talk to one of my friends up front or, or go out in the atrium to the right down the north hallway. You're going to find the volunteer wall. And, and on there is a lot of opportunities, investment opportunities for you to give your time and talent and treasure to. And you can look for ways to invest in things that are going to outlive, outlast this life. See, because for now we live in the meanwhile. Jesus is coming back, but for now we get to make the most of the meanwhile. If you haven't before, I challenge you and encourage you, invite Jesus to lead your life. Accept him as your king today. Just pray a simple prayer. Say, Jesus, I want you to rule and reign in my life. I want you to be my sovereign. I want you to be my king. I don't have all the answers yet, but I want you to be in charge. And then take that worship folder, that pamphlet you got on the way in. There's a little fold out. Fold that out. Fill that out. Check a box, and that'll give us opportunity to just walk with you and and, and come alongside you with different opportunities as they come to help you follow Jesus. And if you're looking for ways to invest your time, your talent, your treasure, stop by out there. Ask someone what you can get involved in if you're not investing it yet because when Jesus comes back, I don't know about you guys. In fact, let me strike that. I think I do know about you. I think you're a lot like me in that we want to hear Jesus come to us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so we're going to wrap up now. We're going to have an opportunity to respond back to God. And one of those responses is not just through song, but through giving and giving some of our treasure back to God to say, this isn't ours, this is yours, God, and I trust you. Take it and use it for your kingdom. So join me as we go to prayer. Almighty God, I just want to say thank you again for the truth of your word that a story from so long ago can be so alive, that the points you made then are so true today. God, help me, help us to invest what we have well in your kingdom and your purposes. God, we love you and we trust you. We want you to be honored and glorified. Use us as we make the most of the meanwhile. In your name, amen.